So please welcome Cynthia Moss. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. I'm afraid I will not be able to tell you what it is like to be a bat, but I will provide some indicators of uh, perception, attention, and memory uh, from behavioral studies in echolocating bats. So as most of you are probably well aware, echolocating bats produce very high frequency sounds. Uh, these sounds are well suited to bounce off of objects in the path of the sound beam. They return to the bat's ears, and the bat can construct a three-dimensional representation of the world from these echoes. And the bat adapts its behavior in response to the processing of these echoes, and that will be the focus of my talk today, these adaptive behaviors. Now, this is a high-speed video slowed down, taken from a colony room in my lab, and you see bats flying around here. And in flight, they avoid collisions with obstacles and other bats. They catch moving, often evasive prey. And they can respond to changing environments, all in complete darkness and uh, relying on echolocation. That doesn't mean that bats are completely blind, but they can operate in complete darkness. So successful navigation in complex environments requires 3D localization of objects, spatial attention and memory, and adaptive behaviors. So really engaging sensory, motor, and cognitive systems. And today I'll be emphasizing the adaptive behaviors. So in my talk, I'll begin with a brief introduction of echolocation, spatial localization by sonar, and describe the challenges bats face echolocating in a complex environment. And then I'll go on and describe some behavioral studies uh, that focus on adaptive sonar behavior. I'll describe a study of target discrimination, another of obstacle avoidance and prey capture, and finally one that require bats to sort signals from their um, own vocalizations and those of other bats. So the star of the show today is the big brown bat, um, Eptesigus fuscus. It's a North American species, and it's an insect-eating bat. I should say that there are hundreds of bat species that have adapted to very diverse environments, and they use different signals. The big brown bat produces a very broadband, frequency-modulated signal. So uh, it produces a sound that sweeps in the fundamental from over 60 kilohertz down to 20, 25 kilohertz in just a few milliseconds. So this echolocation call is very well suited for spatial localization. So you see on the frequency axis here, on the vertical axis, uh, goes from 100 down to 20 kilohertz. And so the, all above the range of human hearing, which uh, the upper limit is about 20 kilohertz. So there was just a question about localization using echo, so I'll just say a little bit about that. So bats produce high frequency sounds and they listen to echoes from objects that return. So the returning object is, you can think of it as a sound source. And if that object is positioned right along the midline, then the echo returning to the two ears will arrive at the same time, same intensity, roughly same spectrum. And the bat makes a comparison of the cues at the two ears to determine that the object returning the echo arrived from the midline. If, however, an object is off to one side, then one ear will receive an echo before the other ear. It will be a little bit more intense, and the spectral content will be different. And the bat can calculate these, uh, the location of the object from the interaural differences. And horizontal localization accuracy in bats has been estimated to be about one degree. Now, bats, like humans, rely on spectral cues to localize in the vertical plane. So what's shown here is uh, spectral measurements taken at the ear of the bat from different vertical positions. So the external ear, you see, is very large. There's this structure called the tragus that influences the spectral profile from different elevations. So from 15 degrees above the horizon to 10 degrees below, you see there's a change in the spectral profile, where the, in this case there's a notch that moves from high 
to low frequencies with elevation. The details aren't so important, but the idea is that the bat can interpret these spectral changes to estimate the elevation of a sound source. And vertical discrimination thresholds in bats uh, has been shown to be about three degrees, which is comparable to humans. Now, bats use the time delay between the sonar emission and the returning echo to estimate the distance. Sound travels in air at a speed of about 340 meters per second. So what that means is for the bat, there's two-way travel time from the bat to an object and back. So there's about six millisecond delay for each meter of object distance. And bats can discriminate the distance to objects with very high accuracy of about one centimeter corresponding to about 60 microseconds. This was first demonstrated by Jim Simmons using psychophysical measures where he trained bats to rest on a platform and the sounds produced by the bat were picked up by two microphones. They were digitized, delayed, played back through speakers and simulated echoes from objects at different distances. So the delay introduced could create one echo at a closer distance or an object at a closer distance than another. And the bat's task in this case was to always crawl towards the side on which it perceived the shorter echo delay. And the echo delay difference between the two sides, A and B, uh, was, was changed from trial to trial. And the bat's performance, if it were just guessing, would be about 50%. But you can see when there's a large difference in the delay or distance between these phantom target echoes, uh, the bat's performance is at about 100%. And as that delay difference gets smaller, the bat's performance begins to drop. And Simmons estimated threshold to be the difference in distance or delay that produced about 75% correct performance, which was about one centimeter or 60 microseconds. So just to sum up, sonar localization accuracy in the big brown bat in the horizontal plane is about one degree, comparable to humans. Vertical degree, uh, vertical about three degrees, again, comparable to humans. And along the range axis, they're very, very good and can discriminate differences about one centimeter or 60 microsecond delay differences. Okay, so now bats are constantly using this spatial information extracted from sonar echoes to adapt the calls they produce. And I'll show you a high-speed video now taken in the laboratory. The bat was trained to fly and take an insect that was hanging on a tether. So the video and the corresponding sound you'll hear were slowed down by a factor of 16. So you can both see and hear the echolocation calls. There's also a spectrographic display of the sounds. That, okay. So the bat will come in from this side here. These are spectrograms now of the calls the bat is producing, these frequency modulated sweeps. So now the bat appears. locks the head onto the target, scoops up the insect with its tail membrane, and transfers it to its mouth. Now it's continuing to make echolocation calls as it's um, eating. It can talk and eat at the same time. <laughs> okay, so now here's a cartoon to show you sort of the pattern of uh, vocalizations you saw as the bat flying towards the insect. Now, of course, in this cartoon, it's a, a free-flying insect, not a tethered insect. But each tick mark here represents the timing of a call the bat produced as it moved closer and closer to the insect. So the bat starts in the search phase when it's producing sounds at five to 10 per second. Then it moves into what's referred to as the approach phase, and here the calls may be produced at up to about 80 sounds per second. And then finally, during the tracking and terminal phase, terminal for the insect if the bat's successful, uh, the sounds will be produced at 150 to 200 sounds per second. So the bat is continuously increasing the rate of its calls as it gets closer to the target. It's also changing the duration of its calls as it gets closer to the target. You may have noticed that in the video, and this is something I'll be talking about quite a bit today. 
Uh, it changes the frequency content of the calls and the directional aim of its calls, something else I'll be describing. So what I've described so far involves a bat in a relatively simple environment in the open using these different cues to localize a single object. But the fact is bats are often operating in much more complex environments where a single call may result in multiple echoes. So if there's vegetation, multiple insects um, at different distances and directions, the bat will receive for every call it produces multiple echo returns and it has to organize this acoustic information uh, arriving from different directions and different delays. Now when bats fly together with other bats, they face another problem and that is sorting their own vocalizations and echoes from those of conspecifics. So now bats, as I've described, adjust their sonar behavior. They make adjustments in the direction, the duration, the frequency, the intensity, and the interval of calls in response to echo information they've gathered from the environment. And these adjustments provide a window to the bat's perception and tell you something about what information the bat has processed and what information it's seeking. And today I'll be talking specifically about adjustments in direction, duration, and frequency. Now this bat, the adaptive sonar behavior of bats contributes to its representation of an auditory scene. The vocal adjustments it makes directly influence the echo returns that determine the direction, distance, and features of objects. It's unlikely that this operates on an echo to echo basis. Sound travel in air, so the bat has to produce a sound, the sound travels to the object, the echo returns to the bat, and then the nervous system has to process this echo information and initiate commands for adaptive behaviors while the environment is changing. So it's unlikely this operates on an echo by echo basis, but instead the bat will be integrating and updating information um, over time. And it must be coordinated with spatial attention and memory. So today I'll be talking about uh, adaptive sonar behavior of the bat in three different tasks. One involving texture discrimination, one involving stationary obstacle and uh, obstacle avoidance and insect capture, and finally a uh, task where paired bats competed for a single prey item. So this is the uh, schematic of the setting used for the different experiments. We have a large flight room, it's about six by six meters, and the walls and ceiling are lined with acoustic foam and it's carpeted. Daniel has visited this and <laughs> this, um, somewhat um, echo attenuating room. We have high speed infrared sensitive video cameras so we run our experiments in very low level long wavelength light to require the bat to um, emphasize echolocation for solving a variety of tasks. We have a microphone array along the walls and the bat is flying freely uh, performing in our tasks. We use the a microphone array to measure the directional characteristics of the sonar beam. So if the bat's pointing its head in one direction, microphones along one wall will receive stronger signals than neighboring walls. And we can use the relative intensity of the signals picked up by the microphones along the walls to estimate the directionality of the sonar beam pattern, in particular where the bat is pointing its head. The big brown bat produces sounds directly through the open mouth, and so where the sound is directed is also where the head is directed. And the center of the beam, it we refer to as the beam axis. So in the first experiment I'll describe, the bat was required to discriminate targets. Now Daniel just mentioned that there is no color in echolocation, there is no color in this experiment. The beads you see here in the pictures show color, but of course this was not a, uh, a cue available for the bat. In this case, the bat was required to discriminate a smooth bead from one of several different texture beads. So in every trial, two beads were hung in the room at random locations. Uh, one was always the smooth bead and one was always one of these textured beads. And the bat's task was to find the smooth bead and tap it. So here's the schematic of the room. You see um, we have the 
S plus refers to the smooth bead, S minus the textured bead. We have microphones also on the floor. And in this case, the bat flew around and then when it tapped S plus, it received a signal, a tone, that told it it could fly to a landing platform and receive a food reward. If it didn't tap the smooth bead, then it didn't get the reward. Okay. And now here's a quick video to show you about actually performing in this task. It's been slowed down so you can see the bat's flight behavior and hear the echolocation calls it produced. You can pay attention to the times when the bat increases the rate of its calling. There. So it approached the target but then flew past. So uh, remarkably, when the bat performs in this task, as it approaches and taps that bead, its behavior is very similar to what it shows as it um, intercepts insect prey. Now here um, is a slide to show the performance of the bat as it uh, discriminated different beads. So you see percent correct performance. Uh, for these different beads, and some beads were very easy for the bat to discriminate from the smooth, others not so much. Uh, this is not what I want to emphasize today, but instead the animal's adaptive behavior performing in the task. So we found in this task that the bat made changes in um, its calls uh, with respect to the direction and distance of the objects and we can use the, the adaptive changes to get some estimate of the animal's acoustic gaze. And here I'll be describing the beam aim, the directional aim of the calls, and the temporal characteristics of the calls. So now here's an animation of a single trial in which a bat is flying and searching for the smooth bead. Uh, you see the bat is flying. Each time it produces a call, you see a circle displayed. Below here are the interval between successive calls and the duration of the calls as the bat um, performs in the task. So you see now it's approaching the two targets, begins to increase the rate, then there's a gap, flies around that one bead and turns to approach and tap the smooth bead. Okay. Now perhaps more informative um, are the directional uh, characteristics of the call as the bat performs in this task. So here you'll see the same trial, bat will be flying, um, you see it's an overhead view and you'll see the beam pattern of the call produced by the bat as it approaches and taps the S plus. S minus, we passed it, turn, and taps the smooth bead. There is no, on this particular trial, there were no microphones here, so there's some distortion in the beam aim reconstruction, but the bat did direct its beam at the bead. Now we can actually track. Uh, compute a tracking angle, that is the angular difference between the beam axis and a target or obstacle. And so from this trial you just saw the tracking angle is plotted and when the circles line up 
with this line here, the beam is directed at the target, and when the beam is directed at the distractor, um, you see the circles clustered here. So you see the bat directed its beam at the target, at the distractor, and then back at the target. Now I've talked about how the bat controls the timing of its call. So as it's approaching an insect or a bead, uh, when it's far away, the calls are longer, and when it gets closer to the target, the calls are shorter. Now, why does the bat adjust the duration of its calls in this way? Well, we believe it's to avoid overlap between its outgoing calls and the echoes returning from objects. So if the, this is just illustrated in a cartoon here, where we ha if we have a, a call, a pulse of a given duration, and there's an object very close, the echo will overlap with the, the vocalization. However, if the bat shortens the call, then it can temporarily separate the pulse and the echo, and the bat actively does this. So these adjustments in the call duration give us some indication of where the bat is attending along the range or distance axis. So now I'll show you the same trial, um, and uh, the radius of the beam pattern now has been scaled to the duration of the bat's call. So you can get some indication of where the bat is attending um, as it's performing the task. The sticks represent the beam axis. So from this animation, you really get a sense of the bat looks at the distractor, then decides to fly past it, and then uh, taps the S+. Plus. And that's just illustrated in um, this slide here, where you see different segments in time. The bat's approaching one, the S-, minus, decides to fly past it. Um, at point two, the call duration is increased as it's looking beyond that target and then shortens the calls again as it approaches the S+. Plus. So in these um, experiments across many, many trials that were analyzed, we find that the bat accurately points its sonar beam in the direction of objects, and it controls the sonar duration with respect to the range of targets. Now I'll describe a, another task that illustrates essentially the same thing. In this case, the bat has to deal with an obstacle and a target. So here again is our flight room, and in this case we have a net stretched across the room with two openings, and the bat has to find a tethered insect behind one of these two openings. There's a partition net that divides the back end of the room to keep the bat honest. So it has to look for the appropriate compartment housing the reward uh, to receive the food. So here's a trial that shows the bat performing in this task. Again, each circle represents the bat's position when it produces a call. See as the bat approaches the net, it's reducing the interval between calls, reducing the duration. Before it flies through, uh, it increases the duration and then shortens it again as it takes the tethered insect. Now here's the beam aim uh, for the same trial. So now here you can see the sticks again represent the beam axis where the bat's pointing its head. You can see that it directs the beam at the edges of the net opening, shifts back between the left and the right sides, then points the beam through the opening and then locks the beam onto the target. And that's just shown here for this particular trial. The bat looks at one edge of the net, the other edge of the net, back to the one edge of the net, and then the insect. So we see the sequential pointing from one object to another, even though they're very closely spaced. And the beam is broad enough to capture echoes from these closely spaced objects. The bat 
intentionally points its beam, like we point our eyes at objects of interest. The, now here's one more trial that very clearly illustrates this. And here, also note the changes in the duration of the calls the bat produces as it first approaches the net. See the calls are short here, and then before it flies through the net, it's already begun to increase the duration of its calls. It's looking beyond the net, the obstacle, to the more distant prey item. And this slide shows data for across several trials, the time which the bat locked its beam onto the worm um, plotted against the time at which it first experienced overlap between its vocalizations and the net echo. Um, the time zero refers to the time when the bat flew through the net. So these data show that the bat shifts the distance of its acoustic gaze at different times in different trials, but from the obstacle to the target. So what I've shown so far is that the bat makes adjustments in sonar signals to actively separate and track objects in the auditory scene. The aim of the sonar beam axis facilitates segregation of objects in different directions, and the duration of signals facilitates the segregation of objects at different distances. Okay. Why does the bat sequentially point the sonar beam at closely spaced objects of interest? Well, we don't really know, but we have some speculation. And one is that the localization accuracy be highest along the midline, and it may also play a role in motor planning. But as I said, it's probably not driven by detection because the beam is really wide enough to capture echoes well off axis. Okay, so the implications of the sequential pointing of the sonar beam is so that the spatial attention shifts with the directional aim of the sonar beam and that working memory must operate uh, to assemble echoes over time to build a representation of the auditory scene. Okay. Now, I was going to say just a little bit about spatial memory and the use of landmarks, but I'm running a little short on time, so I can come back to this later if people have some questions. So I'll skip over these slides and just briefly tell you about the experiment in which two bats competed for a single prey item. Now, we use the same room, and we have multiple microphones on the floor that play an important role in allowing us to assign calls to the vocalizing bats. Because it's a really kind of a mess. Here's a short snippet of calls recorded from two bats. And if you just look at this, um, it's very difficult to say which bat was vocalizing when. But with the use of our video cameras that tell us the 3D position of the bat in the room and the microphones that tell us about uh, time delays of sounds produced by animals in different locations, we can accurately um, identify which bat is calling uh, at any point in time. I won't go through the details here, but we, we did successfully do this. And what we found um, is when these bats were paired, uh, competing for a single um, prey item, they produced, showed two strategies. One, um, adaptive increase in the call design separation. So the bats, uh, when they flew alone, we looked at the calls they produced and characterized them, and then we paired them. And uh, we saw that they could make adjustments in their call design, and then we also found that bats sometimes went silent. So I'll show you an animation that um, illustrates both call adjustment and silence. So each of the bats is shown in a different color. And remember, when the bat produces a call, there's a circle displayed to show its position when it makes that call. The interval, duration, and frequency of the calls produced by the two bats shown below. Okay. Okay. So that sneaky red bat was silent for a long stretch and then snuck up the last minute and took the insect and the poor blue bat was a little bit mystified, didn't know quite what happened. Okay. <laughs> now we've measured the parameters of the calls, as I mentioned, in baseline when the bats were um, flown individually and then when they were paired. And we found that bats with similar 
uh, call design increase the separation between the acoustic parameters of their vocalizations, and bats that had dissimilar call design to start with didn't bother. And that was true for all the frequency um, characteristics that we measured. And what's shown here is just the magnitude of the start frequency separation, uh, large and small. It's a function of the baseline start frequency separation. So when they already showed large differences, they didn't bother to make adjustments. But when they didn't sh have large differences to start with, then they made adjustments when they were paired. And the magnitude of the, the adjustments also depended on the separation between the bats. And I'll just say a little bit about the silent behavior. Okay, in bat time, uh, 200 milliseconds is a long time. Okay, between the time of detection and capture of an insect is often less than a second. So we define silent behaviors, one or both bats, ceasing vocalization for at least 200 milliseconds. And this was almost never observed in bats flying alone. However, when bats were paired, uh, we observed it 40% of trial time when the bats were separated by a meter or less. And we found that the mean distance covered by bats during this silent period was one and a half meters, but it could range up to over seven meters. We found, like the adjustments in the vocal behavior, um, the characteristics of the calls, uh, the silent behavior depended on the spatial separation uh, between the two bats. We found the most silent behavior when the bats were very close together. And we also found that the prevalence of silent behavior depended on the baseline similarity of the calls the bats produced. So when the bats showed very similar call design, they showed more silent behavior than when they had showed dissimilar call design. And we also paired individual bats with more than one bat. And when they, and their silent behavior depended on the similarity of the calls with which, of the bat with which it was paired. So if the bat showed low similarity to an individual it was paired with, it showed less silent behavior than when it was paired with a bat that for which it had high similarity. So these letters here, HP54, Y31, they refer to the individual bats. And you see for each of the individual bats, there's an increase in silent behavior when it's paired with another bat with um, more similar calls. So now, just to sum up, apologize for running over. Um, a silent bat listens passively and analyzes the auditory scene by listening to calls of the neighboring bat and by listening to echoes from the calls of the neighboring bat. bat. But it's really an open question. Can the bat obtain detailed spatial information about auditory objects when it listens passively? And we should note that in the task when the bats were going after a single prey item, the bat was never silent just before uh, attempting capture of the tethered insect. So the bat's vocal behavior in complex environments suggests that it segregates and tracks dynamic auditory objects by actively controlling the echo information it uses to analyze the scene. The direction, it controls the directional aim of the beam, and it sequentially inspects closely spaced objects. Uh, it controls the duration of its calls uh, to shift gaze along the range axis. It controls the frequency of its calls to avoid signal jamming. And collectively, these uh, adaptive behaviors serve the bat to operate in a complex environment. So what is it like to be a bat? <laughs> I'll leave that to you. <laughs> <laughs>